time once again for Community Forum, and we're very lucky to have back with us live in the studios this morning, Michael Withy. Michael Withy is a Seattle-based attorney and author of the new book, Summary Execution, The Seattle Assassinations of Silme Domingo and Jean Viernes. Michael, thank you very much for coming back in and spending time with us today. Yes, thanks so much for having me, Mike. So start out, uh, tell us, what was your motivation in writing your new book, Summary Execution? Well, ever since the murders happened in June of 1981, uh, Cindy Domingo and Terry Mast and I have talked about how do we hold those accountable in all respects. Everybody that was involved with this murder and their cover-up, we felt needed to be held accountable. And fortunately, we were able to win a $15 million verdict against Ferdinand Marcos for the murders. But we also realized that there was an, a sinister element involved, including the U.S. intelligence agencies that assisted in the cover-up that we wanted to expose. But um, I was practicing law, and I didn't have the time to write the book until I retired. It took six years to write this book. It was a, a labor of love, to be sure. Uh, but it also um, resulted in uh, the ability to tell the story of some incredibly courageous and uh, determined women in particular. Uh, Selmy and uh, had left his sisters and family, and they were such great, great uh, justice advocates as well as the Viernes family. So I want, basically I wanted to tell the, their story and the story of the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes, which I hope I've done. So go back a bit. You were actually not only a practicing attorney at the time, but you were friends with uh, both Selma and Jean. Yes, I'd met Selmy in the in the mid to early 70s uh, when when we were fighting against the kingdom, basically. Selmy went out and said, this is the developers. These are people who are not going to give housing to us. And they all put a hex on the kingdom, which I think came to fruition. And I met Gene as part of the anti-Marcos movement. And um, <clears throat> both of them brought me in to be the lawyer for local 37 cannery workers. So we had spent the previous two summers in Alaska doing union organizing. Uh, Selmy was my best friend, uh, and uh, he would loan me his car when my family came into town, and we'd sit around on Sundays and, you know, talk talk about politics, talk about the Mariners, and um, he was a very dear friend. So when they killed my friends, I took it personally. So talk about the, um, give us some background on what happened that day and, and talk about the assassinations themselves. Well, on 4.20 in the afternoon, June 1st, um, two hitmen entered the Union Hall uh, on 2nd and Main. Jimmy Ramil was the trigger man. Ben Galloy was kind of a decoy because Selmy had known Ben. Wouldn't be surprised if Ben was coming around. And then another member of the Tulasan gang, Boy Pilai, stood watch. And then Tony Dictato was across the street in his black Trans Am as a getaway car. They came in the Union with uh, a MAC-10 45 caliber execution piece that we eventually linked to the Union president and Marco's ally, Tony Baruso. He, uh, Ramil took it out of a paper bag and emptied two sh uh, rounds into Gene, killing him instantly, and then four into Selmy. And then left down the uh, down the alley, put the gun with the suppressor into a brown paper bag. Selmy with four 45 caliber bullet holes in him, watching his friend bleed out on the union floor, was able to chase the hitman out of the uh, union office and collapsed on the sidewalk, but not before hailing down a fireman from a fire station a block away, and then uttering those two words. Ramil and Galloy that started to unravel the murder conspiracy, leading not only to Tony Dictato and Boy Pilai, but eventually to Tony Baruso, and then finally, after years of investigation, directly to the Marcos regime. We didn't know at the time that Marcos was behind it. It was made to look like a dispute over dispatch, hot-headed Filipinos shooting it up in the local union hall, uh, because the... Tulasan gang had wanted to get dispatched to Alaska, and Gene had in implemented a fair dispatch uh, uh, a procedure that didn't require people to bribe Tony Baruso anymore. And it was thought at the time, initially, that, well, maybe the Tulasan gang had Gene killed because of the unfair dispatch. 
But what the reality was, in two more weeks, there was going to be another dispatch to that same cannery, and many of the Tulasan gang members would have been dispatched. So we realized that wasn't a theory that was going to hold together. And we started looking for who had the interest in having them killed. And that's what allowed us to trace Gene and Selmy's last two months and to look at the work that they were doing to aid the anti-Marcos opposition in the Philippines. So Gene had traveled <clears throat> to the Philippines, but through the Bay Area, where the, uh, their organization, Union of Democratic Filipinos, was headquartered. <clears throat> and little did we know at the time, but the Naval Investigative Service out of Alameda had infiltrated the KDP, Union of Democratic Filipinos, with informants. So Gene had traveled through and carried $2,900 to give to the religious order in the Philippines. Well, it turns out we later found out naval intelligence informed Marcos intelligence that Gene was carrying $290,000. Well, in the Philippines, we retraced the steps, and he went not only to meet with the New People's Army that was conducting a guerrilla warfare against Marcos in the countryside, but then came into the cities, and he met with the large union federation, was outlawed by Marcos at the time, called Kilisan Mayo Uno, May 1st Movement. And that was a left-led, very militant union federation of hundreds of thousands of workers that was causing problem for Marcos in the city. He met with the leadership of the KMU, got evidence of the repression against the labor movement in the Philippines. Picket lines were shot at, people were arrested, uh, the unions were outlawed. And so he brought this uh, information and joined Selmy Domingo in Hawaii, where they were having the convention of the International Longshore and Warehouseman Union, a large, very progressive union on the West Coast in Hawaii convinced the local leadership of Local 142 in Hawaii, the largest local in the ILWU, to support a resolution, to send an uh, investigative team that, of course, Gene and Selmy would have headed, to go back to the Philippines, meet with labor, meet with workers, and then to write a report about the way Marcos is treating the labor movement. Well, as you can imagine, the Mar pro-Marcos forces in Hawaii went crazy, tried to stop the resolution, was hotly contested, and they got all the... Uh, information about the quote-unquote new society from the local consul general, Trinidad Alcancel. Well, we know now that all of that information about the passage of that resolution went straight to Malacanang Palace, and Marcos realized that there was serious problems with the way in which his forces had failed to stop the work that Gene and Selma were doing. It was front-page headlines. Because the ILWU loads and unloads all the commodities going to and from the Philippines and Hawaii and the West Coast. And the ILWU had, had work stoppages to aid, uh, to oppose U.S. involvement in Central America. They wouldn't load and unload uh, commodities that went to El Salvador, for instance. So the whole idea of uh, a union like the ILWU being anti-Marcos just you know, drove them crazy. So on May 4th, right after the convention in Hawaii, the head of the union and pro-Marcos ally Tony Baruso bought a ticket to San Francisco for May 17th. We had no idea when we first found that out why he would be going to the Bay Area. So then uh, he came back, met with Dictato, provided his MAC-10 for the murder, and paid the hitman $5,000. We had no idea where he would have gotten the money. He wasn't necessarily that wealthy. Well, <clears throat> eventually we were able to prove that... Um, first, that the money for the hit was paid to Baruso out of I a mean, Marcos-run intelligence slush fund in the Bay Area run by an ally of Marcos. And this slush fund was used to pay illegal campaign contributions, propaganda outlets like radio stations and pro-Marcos newspapers, as well as for quote-unquote special security projects. On May 17th, the very day Baruso went down to the Bay Area and came back. There was $15,000 expended out of uh, the Marcos Intelligence Slush Fund. 5000 went to the hitman, and we traced 10000 in cash going into Bruce's account. We didn't do that until we were able to get Marcos in the U.S. after he was overthrown. We took his deposition and subpoenaed his financial records, and we found this smoking gun of the Mubuhai payment. And that's the reason we were able to prove that Marcos was involved in a conspiracy to commit these murders. 
So obviously that wasn't all evident right at the beginning. Um, right. Hadn't, um, hadn't Gene and Selmay just like a couple weeks prior to their assassination uh, instituted the changes there at the union for how um, dispatch, which is dispatch is just um, who gets to go to which cannery in Alaska. Is that right? Correct. <clears throat> the dispatch had been run by Baruso, and it was his friends or people that bribed him or people who paid money to him. But it was also the people who used to work. I mean, the foreman wanted to make sure they had good, you know, cannery workers. And it's a tough job. And the whole idea of people killing one another to, in order to get jobs in the canneries in Alaska to us was a little strange in the first place. But there was gambling. But Gene and Selmy weren't trying to stop the gambling. They were just trying to make sure the dispatch was fair based upon both the union constitution and the collective bargaining agreement with the Seattle, I mean, with the, uh, with the seafood industry, which said you, your dispatch would be based on priorities. If you worked at that cannery the prior year, you could go back first prior preference. If you worked at the same company, second preference. If you worked somewhere in, in Alaska in canneries, it was the third preference. And so... It was a very fair um, procedure that the rank and file movement in the union, which Gene and Selmy headed, were pressing for, along with stronger enforcement of the contact, contracts. So Gene and Selmy were also union reformers, and they got into trouble with the, with the industry and with Baruso. But Baruso was always on the side of the industry, you see. And Gene and Selmy had filed race discrimination cases through uh, Mike Fox and other great lawyers in Seattle in order to... Uh, in order to make sure that the discrimination in the Alaska industry was ended. Well, the Baruso never supported that. He supported the side of the, of the industry. So part of the story is certainly Gene and Selmy is very effective union organizers and reformists, but the critical element came from the Marcos regime. Uh, Baruso certainly had multiple motives, but um, the critical element came from the Marcos regime. Um, but what surprised us the most, if we could... Turned to it was once Ramil and Galoy were named, they were arrested and they were going on trial. Well, the strangest thing happened at the trial. At the end of the trial, <clears throat> during the defense case, a mystery witness popped up, and I write about it in my book. And if I could quote from it, Mike, this is right after Gene uh, was killed and Selmy was outside naming the hitmen. And Selmy asked if he was going to die, and the fireman said, It doesn't look good. <clears throat> Across the street from the Union Hall, a middle-aged man in a gray suit and dark glasses emerged from a telephone booth, looked at the scene in front of the Union, and slipped into his car. As he pulled away from the curb heading south on 2nd Avenue, he lifted a CB radio to his lips and started to speak. This gentleman, I shouldn't call him a gentleman, this agent, came to trial at the end of the Hitman case, Ramil, testified for Meal and Galois. And he testified he saw the whole thing, that the guys that went in the union hall didn't look anything like Ramil and Galois, that he had seen the guy come out holding his chest. He went across the street and asked him what happened. And he claimed, Selmy said, I've been shot. And this guy said, well, who shot you? And he said, I don't know. He took the two words that unraveled the murder conspiracy of Ramil and Galois. <clears throat> this mystery witness took those words out of his mouth and said, no, he never said that. And we went crazy when we heard this at trial and wondered, who the heck is this guy? Well, the prosecuting attorney at the time found that this guy was connected with uh, the Howard Hughes uh, operation, that he had testified actually for Robert Mayhew. People may know him if you're a Kennedy conspiracy buff. He's the guy who the Kennedy administration used to contact the mafia to assassinate Fidel Castro. That's who this guy said could vouch for him with Hughes. Well, Maida made it look like the guy was a wacko and had come because he wanted to pop up as a mystery witness in these famous cases as he had done in the past. But five years later, we took this guy's deposition and guess what? He was an FBI informant. Now think of this for a second. He admitted being an FBI informant. The FBI has said he was a used as a reliable informant for years out of Southern California. Of course, this is up in Washington. 
we uh, he lied and never admitted to any connection to the Seattle office of the FBI. But we were always wondering, well, how did this guy, his name was Levane Forsyth, how did he get there? Someone must have known about the murder conspiracy happening on that day at that time to send an FBI informant. So what we did is ask this guy, Forsyth, well, what was your modus operandi? What, was, what did the FBI have you do? And other, in addition to planning surve electronic surveillance equipment, doing black bag jobs for the Hughes people, doing deliveries, he said, well, I would be called by my control agent. And I would be told, go stand on this location or go to this restaurant and go to this thing, observe what happened and write a report, kind of passive surveillance. And he did. This guy said, and I said, okay, well, you were there. Did you write a report? He says, yeah. When? On the same day. I wrote a report. Well, who'd you show it to? Well, I showed it to my wife and a neighbor on June 1st. Yes, on June 1st. Well, then who did you send it to? And the answer was, I'm not trying real hard to remember. So he never admitted who he sent it to. But we now know, through our Freedom of Information Act, <clears throat> excuse me, request, that this uh, informant had a control agent in the Seattle office of the FBI between 1980 and 1986. So not only did this guy get put there, we think possibly by the FBI local control agent, but then was allowed to go in and testify, perjure himself in order to exonerate the hitman. Now, here's a Marcos hit, the first time any foreign head of state's ever been held liable for the murder of U.S. citizens on U.S. soil, and the FBI knows about it in advance and sends their guy to watch it and then to try to perjure himself to exonerate the hitman. It's just unacceptable. And so what we've done now is launch a new petition drive to force the FBI to reveal all that they know about Forsyth and who their control agent were so that we can begin to look at investigation of possible obstruction of justice case against the local FBI. And I understand uh, you have a website, michaelwithy.com. Um, right. There, there is a petition on your website. For there is. Go to www.michaelwithy.com. You can, of course, you can buy the book. Please do so. But also we have a petition drive, and you can sign the petition. It asks very simply to have the FBI come clean, open the files, and open a case. And I think that's why we're very gratified by having the support of local elective officials, civic leaders, community organizers uh, across the board, from labor to the minority communities, Del Centro de la Raza, to all the great uh, public interest organizations. And uh, we were very gratified at our recent launch party. We had on last Tuesday at the Labor Temple a wonderful commemoration of the lives and work of Selmy Domingo and Jean Fairness that you attended and, and, and had a great video of, which you can also see on your, on your uh, Facebook page, I think. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're what we did your was, um, it was very gratifying because the mayor came to introduce my co-counsel, Jeff Robinson, tried the case against Marcos with me. He's now with the National ACLU. And uh, after her talk, Jenny came back, uh, Jenny Durkin, the mayor, came back. And she was also the former U.S. attorney, by the way, for the Western District of Washington for eight years under the Obama administration. Wonderful, wonderful person. So she, um, she was able to say, you know, when deaths like this, murders like this tend to rip a community, it's important to get disclosure. And she said, we, um, I called the local head of the FBI and asked him to be transparent and to cooperate. That was fantastic. So we're very grat gratified by that support. So, and wasn't this during the same time that uh, the FBI ha was still running their COINTELPRO program? Yeah, the, the uh, very good point, Mike. The, the con confluence of, of, of three kind of nefarious operations on the U.S. side came together in Gene and Selmy's murders. First was the fact that Naval Investigative Service had informants inside the Union of Democratic Filipinos surveilling them on the West Coast, and particularly in Oakland. Second was the fact they shared that intelligence with not only Marcos intelligence, but with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And the um, Naval Intelligence had opened up what, what they called an executive order case, which means in order for the military to infiltrate a domestic organization, 
they needed to get the president's approval. Well, they got Gerald Ford to sign an executive order allowing this infiltration. In addition, the Union of Democratic Filipinos had thousands of pages of FBI surveillance documents that we were able to recover. So the FBI, for instance, had pictures inside Gene, uh, I mean, Selmy and Terry's apartment. They had, they had witnesses and informants at their anti-Marcos organizational rallies within the KDP. So we had the Naval Intelligence and the FBI were cooperating with the fact that Marcos had also sent his spies to the U.S., and Marcos had a what we call the Philippine infiltration plan, military attaches attached to the consulates in Seattle, Hawaii, the Bay Area. And along with, eventually, we found out this intelligence slush fund out of the Bay Area used uh, to pay for the murders. So uh, Gene and Selmy, unfortunately, came into the target zone of all three of these intelligence agencies, and it resulted uh, in their murders. We now all know this now, but believe me, in June of 1981, uh, we were just we were just speculating and wondering how did this happen. But we developed the theory, and the theory was that Marcos had it done and, and went out and tried to find if there was evidence to support it. It turns out that there was. Uh, Marcos was found liable because we proved a conspiracy. The conspiracy was to violate the constitutional rights of people like Gene and Selmy and the anti-Marcos opposition, to use threats of violence, force, um, physical violence against not only Gene and Selmy, but against Senator Aquino. Benigno Aquino had gone back to the Philippines in 1983 to run against Marcos. He never got off the plane. He was assassinated by Marcos's military. We put on trial the Marcos regime in 1989 in federal court and included playing the tape of the Aquino assassination, as well as, of course, evidence of other acts of murders and intimidation by the Marcos regime. This was a heinous, heinous dictatorship that used summary execution as a tool of policy. Unfortunately, the present governor in the Philippines under Rodrigo Duterte uses an even more extreme example of this, not only against people that are involved in drug dealings or drug use, but now recently against 600 top level members of the opposition in the left in the Philippines, who is now broken with Duterte. So we're, we're very concerned about the historical parallels of what's going on in the use of summary execution in the Philippines under Duterte with the examples of uh, what happened with Marcos intelligence here. One last detail, there's a General Esperon who happens to be the national security advisor of Duterte's government presently. He was a NISA agent. NISA was the intelligence agency that Marcos created, including to, in the U.S. Esperon, between 1978 and 82, was in the United States as a foreign intelligence spy. So all of this is uh, history coming back to repeat itself, unfortunately, Mike. And the current U.S. president has praised the president of the Philippines. Well, we also see parallels uh, because um, a great... Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Eric Nalder here, who's an incredible investigative reporter, he's written a review of the book in which he calls to our attention the fact that whenever a foreign government tries to use illegal means to affect our policies, our election, as what, ha what happened with Russia in 2016, we, it's a, it should be considered an attack on our country. That's why we can't understand and can't accept the FBI not becoming clean. This is a murder of U.S. citizens by a foreign government. It's been proven in court. What else do they need other than to say, sure, if our people knew anything about this, we'll turn it over to you. That's why we're increasing the pressure on the FBI, uh, because it's just unacceptable to have a foreign government be able to do things like this in our country, particularly against people like Gene and Selmy, who were doing nothing illegal, were just exercising their constitutional rights to um, free speech and organ organi organization and to uh, affect the change in policy of our government. Mm. And also back then, weren't unions stronger in the U.S. than they are now? So well, particularly the ILWU was a very strong union. It still is. But yeah, the, the, the threat that the union movement of uniting the union movement in the United States against Marcos was just, I mean, that was a huge, huge threat. But I think the fact that Gene and Selmy were kind of interjecting themselves into, in a peaceful way, into the politics uh, of the Philippines in support of the labor movement, I think that kind of drew the line that Marcos couldn't stand uh, for ha to have something like this happen. So 
Uh, like I said, it's the first and only time a foreign leader has been held liable in courts. And it's it's to the credit of our civil justice system in this country and the federal courts that we could even prove a case like this. I mean, this is not your typical run of the mill, uh, you know, fender bender. Uh, this was a case involving highest levels of the Philippine government, the U.S. government. We were able to prove, for instance, that the State Department knew about this, knew that Marcos was sending his spies here and actually had warned him about it. But they never did anything to stop it. And it's time that we stop aiding autocratic regimes abroad like Duterte or like uh, what's going on with uh, Trump in Russia. It's, it's time we... We start, supported freedom-loving and de democracy-loving regimes rather than those that try to repress their people. And did you say that Marcos was buying radio stations? Or yes. We, uh, the Mabuhay Corporation, when, once Marcos was overthrown, he came to Hawaii, and we slapped a subpoena on him. And that subpoena produced this document. It's an amazing document because it has the expenditures of close to a million dollars out of this Mabuhai Corporation, and the expenditures are detailed. 50000 went to Ronald Reagan. Um, tens and tens of thousand dollars went to local politicians in the Bay Area. And then there was money set aside for the purchase of a radio station and a newspaper. And it was run by a guy named Dr. Malabed, and then Malabed was a Marcos ally who ran the Mabuai Corporation. And once we found this document, we brought him into the lawsuit. We sued him, and a federal judge found that he was liable for the murders for running this intelligence slush fund as part of the conspiracy. Well, in addition to all of that, it had special security projects. Well, that's pretty sinister. And it was using, it was using code words of like, well, do you have 15,000 tablets and, and those kinds of ways in which our expert witnesses said, well, this was clearly an intelligence slush fund set up to include things like paying for these murders. Um, we, were, we knew that Bruce had traveled there on May 17th, but when we got this document and saw this payment on May 17th and were able to trace those funds and cash into various accounts, uh, we knew that uh, we were going to be able to prove our case in court to the satisfaction of a federal jury, and we did. Did any of the Marcos money go to any uh, local Seattle or Washington state um, elected officials? They, it did not. They were, the money went to the f federal elections uh, for president, went to Board of Supervisors of San Francisco, went to California state politicians. Um, and um, it's just, you know, it's foreign money in elections. It's illegal. It's just like Russian money in elections. You know, you're not supposed to use foreign money to, to fund your campaigns. All of the campaigns acknowledged that they had received these funds, but claimed they thought it came from Dr. Malabed. And Dr. Malabed, you know, just wasn't about to spend a million dollars of his own money. Uh, you know, he got the money from Marcos, and this clearly proved it, because it, it, you know, I, it has a signature on the bottom of Malabed. I acknowledge receiving $1 million from the Philippine National Bank under the authority of General Vare, who was Marcos's henchman, his Marcos's intelligence head. Only a minute left. So did uh, local uh, Seattle prosecutors, I believe Norm Malang was uh, in charge then, did they pursue this aggressively or? The, Norm Malang uh, did a great job on the Tulisan gang. That's all they got convicted. And eventually, after we won our case, they had refused to charge Baruso. His gun was a murder weapon. Sworn testimony was he paid for the murders. He had a motive. He had all of this information. And yet... Well, as long as Marcos was in power, they never charged him. It was really a very unfortunate uh, part of the cover-up, and we were very disappointed, happy that they got the hitman, but disappointed they didn't go after Marcos. Not a lot of prosecutions are going to go after a foreign head of state, but once we did prove that Marcos was involved, they came back and charged Bruce, so got him convicted, and, uh, and he died in prison. Talking with uh, local attorney Michael Withy. He is author of the new book, Summary Execution, The Seattle Assassinations of Silme Domingo and Jean Viernes. And uh, again, your your website is michaelwithy.com. Michaelwithy.com. Our Facebook is The Domingo and Viernes Story. Visit and, us, please. And people can find the petition on uh, both. The petition's on both. Um, just add your name and uh, you're in good company. Thank you so much for supporting it. All right. 
Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. Thank you so much for coming in and spending time with us. Thank you, Mike.